Once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining tonight's program with the Coastal Mountains Land Trust and the Camden Public Library. This is our Nature Talk series, and tonight we're going to be hearing from Aaron Bergdahl about forest pathogens in Maine. And I'm going to now turn the program over to Roger Rittmaster, who's here this evening representing the Coastal Mountains Land Trust. He'll tell you a little bit about the Land Trust and then introduce tonight's presenter. Thank you, Roger. Take it away. Oh, go ahead and unmute yourself first. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with Coastal Mountain Land Trust, our, our local land trust. Uh, there's a couple of things that are coming up I want to let you know about. First of all, this Sunday uh, from 6.30 to 7.30, there's a full moon walk uh, at the Round the Mountain Trail. And you can find information about that on the Coastal Mountain Land Trust website. Um, it's, it is on Hope, uh, the talk starts on Hope Street in Hope uh, and is at the Thorndike Brook Trailhead. On Thursday, next Thursday, a week from today, from 4.30 to 6.30 in Belfast at Waterfall Arts, there's a discussion, a uh, fireside chat, and it will highlight Coastal Mountain Land Trust. Each uh, month they do a, um, a nonprofit uh, description and discussion about it. And this one will be Coastal Mountain Land Trust. But most importantly, I, when I talk about Coastal Mountain Land Trust, um, I'm, I want to talk to you now about a new program, an educational program. And I hope all of you can see my screen. Uh, is that possible? Yeah, I can see it. Looks good. Okay. Well, um, so this is Leah, Leah Traumer. Leah's a new hire for Coastal Mountain Land Trust focusing on education, natural history education. And she's leading a program called Learning Landscapes. The Land Trust is trying to conserve land near or adjacent to schools so that students can easily go out and learn about natural history uh, on those preserved properties. Uh, the, the program from Coastal Mountain Land Trust also supports uh, teaching uh, or educating the teachers, helping them design programs to ed educate the kids, and also uh, provide leaders to, uh, to go on walks as part of her program. So welcome, Leah, and I'm really looking forward to the work you're doing. I think it's super important Land Trust has gotten involved in education programs. All right, now, and I'm gonna unshare my screen, okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Bergdahl, our speaker. Uh, Aaron's a forest pathologist with uh, uh, the state of Maine, the Forest Service. He started his life, um, well, in Minnesota, but grew up in Vermont. Uh, but various things took him to, uh, to Finland, where he met his wife and uh, also completed a master's um, in, in forest health. Uh, he then went to North Dakota where he spent seven years as a uh, forest service manager before moving to Maine, uh, where he's now a staff forest pathologist with the, the Maine Forest Service. Uh, now, there's one thing I want to tell you about his talk. Uh, most of you know Gary Galasian, or a lot of you do, who's actively involved in the land trust. Well, Gary invited me over to his house in the spring and said, uh, what's this on these beech tree leaves? And I looked at them and said, I have no idea. And he said, could this be beech leaf disease? And I never heard of beech leaf disease. And I asked him, well, is it in Maine? And he said, no, no, but I think that's it. And every leaf on every tree on his property was affected. So that's part of what Eric is gonna teach us about tonight. And I can't wait to hear this, this talk. So Aaron, take it away. I'm looking forward to this. I'm sure we all are. Okay, I think I'm up and running. Can everybody see my uh, my yeah, presentation? So screen looks one? good. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Thank thank you, Roger, for the introduction. Um, my name is Aaron Bergdahl. I am the forest pathologist uh, with the State of Maine Forest Service, and I intend to talk to you tonight about uh, a couple pathogens that are changing Maine's forests. Um, and I'm going to get started with just a general overview of what forest pathology is and forest pathology is a subdivi subdivision of plant pathology dealing primarily with woody plants. <coughs> Excuse me. 
it's the study of fourth path, uh, for, force pathogen symptomology, identification, life history, and management implications. And pathogens are parasitic microorganisms that um, that, uh, that cause disease, meaning that they attack plants to obtain the energy and nutrients that are necessary for completing their life cycles. So I uh, just want to start my timer here so I can keep track of myself. So force pathology doesn't just include fungi or bacteria or viral diseases. It also includes phytoplasma, which is kind of like a bacteria, um, uh, nematodes of woody plants, uh, and you'll hear more about those in a little bit, uh, parasitic plants of trees, environmental, environmental disorders, and herb herbicide exposure. Basically, anything that's not an insect ends up on my desk uh, here in the, in the state of Maine. So, something obstructing my screen here. Okay, so uh, themes and forest pathology, I'm not going to tie my tongue up, uh, you know, voicing all these, but there's a lot of, a lot of things, just like any job, there's a lot of things that go into, uh, you know, having, having a good understanding of forest pathogens, forest pathogen systems, and just uh, forest ecology but, uh, and, and management, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, I guess I'd say that there's a lot of crossover with uh, general plant pathology involving food crops, but because plant pathology involves food crops, um, there's a lot more money that goes to studying forest, uh, sorry, uh, plant pathology and uh, therefore that science is a little bit further advanced. In addition, um, it's much easier to study, you know, annual crops than it is to grow, to study trees that grow in the forest for, you know, hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years. So as forest pathologists are always, always a little bit jealous of the plant pathologists and, and the resources that they have access to. Um, forest pathology is really important. Um, my entomologist colleagues like to argue with me about this, but the fact is this, that tree diseases are the leading cause of timber losses each year in the United States, and that's more than all other stress, uh, stress factors combined, and I believe this is true for the entire world. Um, diseases uh, in the past uh, have in the past and will continue to, you know, result in catastrophic epidemics that wipe out entire tree species and destroy native forest ecosystems, and we've got some really unfortunate examples of that. Chestnut blight, um, uh, you know, decimated to about something like 40% of, uh, you know, our, our native forests, um, or that, that was a component of, the, of our, you know, once native forest, a Dutch elm disease, all but eliminated uh, elm trees from urban and rural settings, a great city tree, a great municipal planting tree, um, that's all, all but been eliminated from, uh, from uh, most places in the United States. Um, there are still some very healthy uh, urban elm populations in places, and I think it's Oregon, but the place I know best is Fargo, North Dakota, where I, I did, uh, I, I worked as forest health manager for seven years and then did a fair amount of PhD work there as well in plant pathology. Um, beautiful elm boulevards there, just like uh, the, the old time pictures. It's one of the many reasons to go and visit Fargo, North Dakota. Um, not this time of year, though. Uh, forest pathologist. What does a forest pathologist do? Uh, not me so much, but a forest pathologist does a lot of studying of uh, tree diseases, both both in forested and planted landscapes. Um, diagnostic work is a big part of uh, being a forest pathologist. It's working with microorganisms, uh, primarily fungi. Um, uh, and, and nowadays, there's a lot more tools, uh, genetic uh, tools, molecular tools to, to help us do our job. Um, but sometimes I feel like those molecular tools are, are a little bit too easy. Field mycology or going out into the field and really looking at fungal fruiting structures and being able to identify fungi based on that, which is the old fashioned way of doing things is, is very important and uh, something that I, I, I particularly uh, enjoy and, and pride myself on. Um, can't take a PCR machine out in the field with you. Um, we provide a lot of, in my job here in Maine, I provide a lot of a tech, technical assistance in the field and on the phone and in email. And uh, a lot can be accomplished these days uh, without getting into the truck and, you know, driving across the state. Uh, you know, a lot of things can be solved with an, an email and a picture of a, a text, a couple texts and uh, pictures on the phone. Um, education and outreach is also a very big part of my, my job, training people on how to identify and manage uh, forest uh, pathogens. Uh, and this time of year, I feel like I'm a professional writer. All I do is write reports and, uh, and all sorts of other writing projects. Uh, federal reports, uh, historical reports for the state of Maine. Um, 
all, all other types of, of writing as well. Lots, lots of writing this time, see the, this time of year. So why do trees get sick? Um, they get sick because they either lack resources to activate the preformed defense mechanisms. Um, trees, when, uh, when a seed is, when a seed germinates and starts to grow, its entire immune system is already on board. It's, it's not plastic like a human's immune system. Um, it is, uh, it, it's stationary and it does not change. Um, uh, there are, you know, processes that are upregulated and downregulated in response to pathogens, but, you know, the, the, the roadmap, so to speak, for those processes is already on board when, uh, when a tree begins to grow. Um, site is a really important part of, of disease because trees that are on good sites are vigorous and tree vigor dictates um, how uh, susceptible a tree is to um, get, getting a certain disease or how severely that, that disease, disease will affect the tree. So changes in site can have really serious impacts to tree health. And a lot of times people don't realize that when they, they build a house and they really want to keep that really nice oak tree, um, but then they put a bunch of soil over the roots, change the dynamics of moisture on the site, um, clear out vegetation that solarizes the soil, changes everything. And some trees are much more resilient to that than others. Um, you know, an oak might actually do okay, but a hemlock, for example, probably will, will die or become really attractive to pests that will further uh, decline its health. Um, so again, injuries and other stressors also reduce vigor. The other reason that trees get sick, sick is that they lack defense mechanisms against specific pathogen, pathogens because they lack coevolutionary history and I'm speaking directly about um, exotic pathogens. Um, trees that haven't had the opportunity to co-evolve over hundreds, thousands of years um, do not have uh, ways to resist attack by, uh, by pathogens. So uh, weather and tree disease or weather and, and a lot of aspects of forest pathology are very closely linked. Uh, prolonged periods of high relative humidity, and that can be not only rain, but fog, mist, dew. Um, it, it, it drives a lot of disease cycles in the forest. So moisture is needed for spore production. I'm talking specifically about fungi. Spore production, spore dispersal, spore germination, penetration of host tissues, and that leads to infection and parasitism. Um, once that spore germinates and enters the host, then it can... Um, it relies on the host's resources and then it doesn't need the moisture as much, but uh, moisture is you know, so important for a, a vast majority of a, a pathogen, especially a fungal pathogens life cycle. Um, also the bacterial pathogens are quite uh, moisture dependent. So moist weather drives fungal pathogens of trees. If prolonged wet weather occurs during infection periods of specific fungi and all fungi have you know, different life histories when they produce spores and, and under what conditions and how much. And if the, the timing and the life cycle and the weather uh, all, all match, uh, you can have successful, fours and, uh, successful spores and a high level of uh, tree disease or severe disease, yeah, as long as you have susceptible hosts. Uh, weather and fungi is also linked um, with uh, structural failures, uh, wind, snow, and ice, broken branches and wounds to trees are entry points for decay fungi. Decay fungi, once they get going and they start to decompose uh, parts of the tree or parasitized tissues, um, that uh, represents a chronic stressor that leads to tree decline. So uh, prolonged saturated soils and drought kind of have the same uh, effect on trees. It damages tissues, fine root dieback, creates uh, oxygen deprivation, so no respiration in the root uh, area uh, or the root tissue. Uh, and that, that is, uh, represents acute stressors leading to faster decline of trees. So one thing to keep in mind during this whole process, uh, this whole presentation, and, and just in terms of tree health in general, is that tree mortality is a process. It's not an event. I get a lot of calls where people say, my tree was fine until last Thursday, and then it, it died. And uh, that's almost never the case unless there's a chainsaw involved or uh, somebody has been using herbicide or in some cases, uh, you know, some pretty serious diseases. But typically um, there's a, a beginning and an end to this process and it tends to span a quite large period of time. So uh, in this model from Tree Disease Concepts by, by Paul uh, D. Mannion from Syracuse University, um, you know, this is a model that, that uh, shows you predisposing factors, which could be a tree in an urban environment, 
poor genetic potential, soil compaction, poor uh, uh, soil fertility, poor soil drainage, climate change, air pollution. Um, these are predisposing factors that lead to inciting factors. So when a tree stressed, an inciting factor might be a, an insect that comes to uh, take advantage of that tree that's somewhat stressed. Um, then there's contributing factors that uh, are kind of like the last little twist in the spiral that lead to tree death. And those could be a lot of times they're root rots or uh, insect attacks, uh, canker fungi, um, various other things like that. So first thing I'm going to talk about is, is beech leaf disease. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, skip my slide. So beech leaf disease was first found in Ohio in 2012. Uh, so that was nine years ago. Um, beech leaf disease was confirmed in Maine just last May uh, in Lincolnville, Maine and Waldo County. Um, so uh, before that, so in 2020, the closest previous uh, known location for for bld which i'll probably refer to it mostly as bld from now on uh, was it, down near the cape in massachusetts and you can see that by the color-coded map here um, beach leaf disease can kill both american and european species of beach and it also impacts asian beaches and those are primarily you know horticultural varieties that people buy for their you know unique growth characteristics color etc so as of December 2021, beech leaf disease has been found in 109 US counties and 11 Canadian counties. And I'll just zoom in on the distribution here. So you can see on the shores of Lake Erie, right around Cleveland, it was, uh, it was first described in 2012. Um, and then since then, it's really blazed its way across the United States and uh, made it all the way to uh, mid-coast Maine and even up into Penobscot County. So uh, it's, it's really made its way across, uh, across the states in, in, in amazing time. So beech leaf disease symptoms are banding of leaves, uh, symptoms that are most easily seen by looking up into the canopy from the understory. And this is what you see when you're in a beech leaf, infect, beech leaf disease infected stand and you look up uh, with the light coming, uh, coming through the leaves, you see these intervenal, so between the veins, dark bands um, that are the result of nematode feeding in the bud over winter. Um, so these, these you see almost immediately as the, the leaves unfurl uh, after the winter. And uh, the nice thing about beech leaf disease, if I can say something nice about beech leaf disease, is that it's, it's fairly obvious. And once you see it, you, you learn it pretty well um, and, and you, you know, it, Unless, unless it's just in a, in a couple of leaves. And we've been in stands where we've only seen, you know, one or two leaves up in the canopy. We've sampled them, we've cut them open. We get, uh, you know, we find the causal origin or uh, the causal agent, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but, uh, you know, when it's severe, you, you certainly know it. And these, this, this banding is a really nice symptom that to cue in on. Distorted leaf growth is another, um, symptom, but again, a lot of things cause distorted leaf growth. But uh, this is what a quote unquote healthy uh, American beech leaf looks like. There's a couple lesions of this and that on there, but nothing serious. Um, but this is the kind of distortion that uh, and deformation that you see. So here on the right, you really get a feel for this leathery kind of tough, thicker leaf, uh, a little bit chlorotic, but it definitely does not feel like a, like a healthy beech leaf at all. And here on the left, you have um, some more, di a different kind of def def deformation, not with the, the leathery, uh, leathery symptom, but it, it almost looks, you know, when, it, if I, if, if I didn't know beech leaf disease existed in, in Maine and I saw these, I'd almost think it was related to chemical exposure, especially if the samples are by a, a right of way, um, it could be you know, related to herbicide. Um, another symptom is that, uh, is that the defoliation and the, uh, you know, mortality of, of seedlings and sprouts, uh, starts in the understory. When they described this disease originally, it kind of, they described it as kind of smoldering in the understory for, you know, three, four, maybe even five years before it really got into the upper parts of the canopy and caused tree mortality. Um, it, it hasn't been that way in Maine, um, and, and there's similar reports from uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island this past year. You know, there was no symptoms in 
in 2020. And then in 2021, it looked like the, the disease had been there for, for years. Uh, so we're really not sure why that is. But this is what the understory looks like uh, in, an impacted, um, in an impacted forest. Uh, a lot of the buds have been aborted due to heavy overwinter feeding by, by the, uh, the causal agent. And um, yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely some mortality and there's been some early defoliation, uh, deformed leaves that are not very good at photosynthesis. Um, and, and you know, this is definitely, these are definitely pictures of, of, a, of a beach forest in decline. And so I, I know a couple of people in the audience know this view quite well. Um, this is taken from uh, Gary and Greta's back porch. Um, and in a typical year, they said, this is just a wall of green and you can barely see through, through the forest. Um, and uh, here you can see clear across to the field on the, uh, on the back side of the property. Um, and I just want to take a, a quick moment to appreciate Gary and Greta for their, their helpfulness in this, this whole thing that is unfortunate to, um, you know, be ground zero for, for this disease, so to speak. But, you know, I, I, it certainly didn't originate from their property. I mean, there's, it, it's widespread around Levin Cellar Pond and, and throughout a lot of Waldo County. But, you know, give, given the uh, unfortunate situation they've been extremely help, helpful and uh, very accommodating and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them and really appreciate first of all their uh, you know vigilance and then uh, reaching out and contacting us um, and uh, sending pictures and, and so forth and uh, I was that was a certainly a memorable day in my career for a lot of reasons so now to the causal agent I think I've I've uh, spilled the beans a couple times by saying the word nematode but um, what causes beech leaf disease? It's a really good question. Uh, researchers aren't 100% sure, but uh, they have named this microscopic roundworm uh, with a nematode as the, as the causal agent, and it's definitely associated with disease. Um, this nematode is native to Japan. Uh, it's likely not that simple. There's probably other organisms that may contribute to uh, the infection cycle. And there may be some fungi or environment, bacteria or environmental factors that trigger something in the disease process. Um, you know, from a path, uh, from a forest pathology perspective, I mean, I don't know of any other pathogen systems where there's an above ground nematode that parasitizes trees, especially leaves. I mean, there's, there's a disease called pine wilt disease that impacts non-native pines planted in the United States. Um, they're impacted, their vascular system is impacted by, uh, by a nematode that's uh, transmitted by longhorn beetles. Um, and that's more of an issue out in the Midwest, but um, you know, this is a very rare situation and you know, there's, a, there's some people studying it, as, as many people as can you know, get funding for it. Um, but right now, most of the research is being done at uh, Ohio State University and with the U.S. Forest Service, a couple other groups too. But uh, I, I try as, as often as I can to participate in a monthly uh, BLD research meeting where I get to, to listen to the, the experts in the field and try to learn what I can so I can share that with people in, in uh, presentations like this and other types of meetings and publication and things of that nature. So, so many questions, not that many answers. We don't even know how it spreads. Um, uh, so, you know, we're kind of really careful when we visit a site that has beech leaf disease. When we leave, you know, we got to try to clean our boots off, you know, try not to wear the same clothes. And, you know, we just don't know uh, what, uh, how, how this thing spreads, what organisms are involved. Is it, is it, uh, is it simply spread through um, exotic you know, nursery trees that uh, have been infected, maybe in a central location, and then distributed all throughout, you know, uh, the Northeast uh, into the lake states, or um, are there migratory birds that eat the buds and in a place where um, uh, beech leaf disease exists, and then they migrate to a new area, and maybe the eggs of the nematode are transmitted in, in the bird's uh, feces, and, and you know, there's just so many questions and on these, you know, in discussions with other people, you know, we can hypothesize all day long, but I'm really hoping that they, they find some answers for us uh, soon. Uh, we don't know how and why symptoms develop. 
And two interesting aspects of beech leaf disease is that nematodes have been found in trees that are completely asymptomatic, which, you know, beech trees that are asymptomatic. And nematodes have also been found in other species than beech, sometimes causing some symptoms, but sometimes no symptoms at all. Um, so this is a very interesting um, thing to think about, as well as the interaction between beech bark disease and beech leaf disease. So two diseases that are very serious that affect beech um, in Maine. Um, Maine has had beech bark disease issues since, oh gosh, the, you know, early 1900s and, you know, pretty much any beach that you see, um, most of them, about 1% are, are uh, have some degree of resistance, but a lot of them have beech bark disease. So then when you add beech bark disease with beech leaf disease, it's, 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 you know, the situation could be a lot different here in Maine because they just don't have much beech bark disease out in Ohio, for example, or Pennsylvania. Um, so very interesting to see how those two diseases interact in the decline of trees, of beech trees. So what happens when you find a new disease in your state? Like we found is beech leaf disease in May. Uh, there's a process. First, we got to find money. We try to find ways to you know, shuffle around some of the general funding we have from the state. We look for external funding, special interest funding. Then we make a plan. We communicate all this, the situation and all the relevant facts to stakeholders gather information, get materials ready, and then we send out a press release and then my phone starts ringing and uh, things get really busy. Uh, step two is we do training and outreach. I mentioned in the, in the introduction that, you know, I do a lot of training and outreach. In a situation like this, you get your materials together, you get your foresters together, and you start training your staff, industry folks, people from soil conservation districts, um, land trusts or, or whomever will listen really and you get people trained up and, and uh, those are the people that are going to help you um, you know distribute more information find new locations um, in uh, you know return the favor by keeping us informed of uh, new areas um, department of agriculture is the regulatory agency for the state of maine so of course they're heavily involved and again, special interest groups like the land trusts who have been extremely helpful, uh, especially Coastal Maine Land Trust uh, in providing um, contacts and also uh, providing sites uh, for us to um, set up long-term monitoring plots, which I'll talk about here in a second. So again, I already talked about the symptoms. Here's just a couple more pictures of symptoms. That one's actually the same, but the symptoms can be a little bit variable, but it's, uh, the banding is, is definitely one you can count on. This leathery leaf uh, symptom is also uh, very quite common. And again, the banding, you can see a different picture of banding here on the right. And here's a very severe uh, bit of banding from Knox County, um, another landowner who uh, alerted me to uh, beech leaf disease on the property. Mr. Power, if he's if he happens to be on on uh, on the call on the presentation. So there are some, uh, as well as teaching people uh, what to look for for beech leaf disease, you got to teach them about lookalikes too, so you don't get false reports. So I got a lot of reports, maybe more reports of woolly beech aphid and aranium galls on uh, on beech leaves than uh, than uh, than I did actual beech leaf disease uh, calls. So woolly beech aphid is a lookalike. It causes uh, marginal chlorosis of leaves, and it causes the leaves to be deformed a little bit they bubble up a little bit in some spots and they tend to curl but when you uncurl that leaf it exposes a white flocculence or, or it's kind of a waxy um, material underneath that leaf that uh, is indi indicative of uh, activity by the woolly beech aphid um, aranium galls th these are maybe even more uh, more of a curveball at this as far as symptomology so you can see that there's uh, definitely some raised uh, leaf material intervenally, but when you flip the leaf over, you see that kind of velvety patch. It, it starts out white and it turns red over time. Um, and uh, the ar aranium galls are caused by an areophyte mite, and uh, that's another lookalike of beech leaf disease. So this is what, uh, okay, the next step is we do a delimiting survey, try to find out exactly where the disease is. So this is what the uh, current beech leaf disease uh, distribution map for Maine looks like right now. Um, when I say delimiting survey, we're, we're a really small group of people. Uh, we have two entomologists, we have three entomologists, uh, and, ent uh, and two entomology technicians out of the uh, Augusta office and me, the pathologist. And, you know, 
we've got brown tail, you know, the entomologists have brown tail moth that they've got to deal with and there's spruce budworm and there's emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid. And now, you know, you throw beech leaf disease onto things. There's just not enough resources for us to get out and do the kind of surveys that we'd like to. It's not, we can't do all hands on deck because uh, there's so many needs. Um, so this could be a much more developed map, I believe is, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like I haven't really been out over into Hancock County. You know, I got out to Islesboro and found beech leaf disease in two areas there, both reported by landowners, again, very helpful. Um, but I haven't been over to Swans Island or, you know, over to Castine area to see if there's beech leaf disease over there. My inclination is that there probably is, but uh, before I get out there, I, I won't know. But this map's gonna be changing quite a bit, I have a feeling, in, in the next year. So again, Aaron, Aaron, we actually just had somebody who wants to know, do you know if it's been uh, located in Winterport? Winterport. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Where is Winterport? Bring it up a map right now just for myself so I can kind of describe it a little bit better. Um, Winterport. Okay. So Winterport is up near Bangor. It's, it's right along the river up near Bangor. Yeah. No, the only place that we found it, you know, and I've got, I've gotten some reports up there and I've, I've checked those and haven't found them. The only place where we found it in Penobscot County was in the Penobscot experimental forest. And we were actually setting up a, a plot, which is the next thing that I'm going to talk about, but we were setting up a, a plot in a, in an area that we, thought did not have beech leaf disease it was going to be kind of like one of these control plots you know you set it up before the disease gets there and you, and, you know you, you monitor it as the disease gets there and, and progresses well we got about halfway through the plot and we started noticing banding when we were doing the crown evaluations and that um that was quite a surprise uh, but um that uh, that's the only place so far that we've confirmed um in in that area in Winterport, I believe I've gotten some reports, but I've gone and checked those and did not find uh, beech leaf disease, just just look likes. So, so step four is plans for the future. So long term monitoring plots is what we what we uh, we had planned to do that the year in 2020. We got funding to set up uh, long term monitoring plots in 2021. And we were sort of, you know, getting our stuff together to get those set up. And then we found beech leaf disease here in Maine. So and we had to get really going. We, we were able to establish eight plots in, in Maine, mostly in the Southern counties, one per county, so we have two in Waldo. Um, and uh, we uh, set them up on state land and research forests, private land ownerships, land trusts. We have one in Head of Tide and, and near Belfast. Um, and we're just gathering baseline tree and stand health information, um, evaluating the, the level of disease and uh, remeasuring, we'll remeasure these tree, uh, these plots every year <coughs> and collect data. And this is being done throughout, you know, facilitated by the US Forest Service out of Durham, uh, New Hampshire. That, uh, and we'll compile all that data and hopefully it'll tell us uh, a lot about uh, beach uh, leaf disease. This is a great example here, this picture. I don't know what I'm doing in that picture particularly, but I'm looking at something, but that, that is a tree that has a very severe beech bark disease. And this is a forest that has very severe beech leaf disease. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in areas that are characterized by this. So that's it for beech leaf disease. I don't know if people have questions now or if we wanna hold those till the end. Um, any, any I go to, a couple questions did come in um, regarding beech uh, leaf disease specifically, so I can just jump in on those real fast. Um, yeah. Someone, Dirk actually says, I have lots in uh, of beech, I have lots of beech leaf disease on my property, 6A, in south in southern Belfast. Is there any citizen science that I can employ here? Um, not, not at the moment. I mean, I, just make sure you get in contact with me and get on my map. Um, we, we've done a lot of roadside survey and just about every place we stopped in, in Waldo County, we were able to find beech leaf disease. Um, you know, I, I guess if I had a, a forest that was uh, full of, of beech leaf disease and I actually got this question on a presentation I did yesterday and I didn't answer it very well. So if there's anybody that was saw me talk about beech leaf disease yesterday and Maine, Maine woodlands owners, um, you know, I guess my, my message is, you know, prepare for the worst. 
um, and start to start to manage for diversity because uh, you know when you have if you have a lot of beach with a lot of beech leaf disease, um, you got to prepare for losing those trees and um, you're gonna have some great firewood for a couple of years, but um, you know you're gonna have to start thinking about the future. Um, right now we don't have any like stand wide treatments. There are some treatments for specimen trees that are being developed by some of the tree care companies, but uh, those are still on a trial basis and uh, there's no, nothing you can do curative wise. Um, as far as citizen science goes, you know, we've got our, we've got our, our, our plots set up and uh, um, it's good to know that we've got cooperators out there that are really, you know, very willing to, to help us out and, and contribute. Uh, so uh, I'd say to that, uh, that person to make sure that uh, send me an email with a picture of some symptoms if you happen to have it. And uh, I'd be glad to put you on the map. Are you going to be putting up your email address at the end of the program? I don't have that in one of my slides. <laughs> Maybe I do. Maybe I do in the last one. We'll, we'll have to see. I, we'll make sure we get it. We get it up. I'm, here, uh, I'm pretty easy and, and to find. Can... Okay, good. Because that was the next question. Somebody else wanted to know how to contact you. Uh, he yeah. lives in Hope and has lots of beech leaf disease on his property. Yeah. So uh, we'll yeah. make sure that we get up some information by the end so that we can get people in touch with you. Um, also, real quick before we move on, uh, Catherine wanted to know, is beech leaf disease found in healthy, vigorous beech or only on poorer sites? It's found, uh, I mean, there's, we don't know of any level of resistance uh, to beech, uh, beech leaf disease. But again, it, we're really early on in, in having a, a clear understanding of the disease. So um, I would say that beech leaf disease is found, can be found in big, healthy, vigorous, beautiful beech trees, just as it can. Um, and actually at G G Gary and Greta's uh, place is a great example. I mean, they have all sorts of beech trees of different levels of health and everything from seedlings that are just popping out of the ground to mature, you know, hundred plus year old trees had beech leaf disease. Um, oh, you know, more open grown ones had it just like the ones in the can uh, closed canopy had it too. So, uh, seems to be very little, uh, resistance out there. Um, is, uh, BLD more of a rulant and more likely to kill a beech, uh, tree faster than beech bark disease? Um, be trees, beech trees in Maine have been limping along with beech bark disease for a really long time. And it's, it's more about, it's more about stress. So, you know, if the tree's on a good site, it can handle quite severe beech bark disease over a long period of time, just like a, a tree might be able to limp along with beech leaf disease over time. If it's just losing, you know, half of its leaves or it's, you know, the canopy is like li living canopy is shrinking, you know, it might, might get by for a little while, but you know, when you compound stresses, um, it's usually a secondary agent that'll come in. It'll be some kind of an insect, a mass insect attack, or it'll be oftentimes with beech, it's, it's root disease that will, come in and take advantage of, you know, the reduced, uh, you know, ability to defend itself uh, due to, you know, not having enough energy for, for growth and defense. Uh, and then uh, those trees are, are, are eliminated. So um, if, you know, if you want to try to preserve your trees as long as possible, do anything you can to, to mitigate stress, which you know, if I had a beech tree in my front yard, I, you know, I'd make sure that it got water when it was real dry. And I'd make sure that there, uh, you know, maybe a little supplemental fertilizer um, and anything you can do to mitigate stress. Aaron, I've got a question for you. It, it boggles my mind how we can go from no disease to uh, uh, like Gary's and Greta's property that are just mm -hmm. uh, inundated with it um, almost overnight. Can you talk or hypothesize how this all happened or is it just boggle your mind as well? It boggles my mind. Definitely. Um, it's, it's, uh, I kind of wonder if there's some environmental cues that, that lead to, you know, really successful nematode population reproduction. Like I said, there, you know, nematodes can be in asymptomatic trees. They've, 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 you know, opened up leaves and, you know, you, you cut open leaves, you put them in, in water for 24 hours and, or even less, and the nematodes start to wiggle out. Um, with a good microscope, you can, you know, do this at home. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, those and nematodes could have been here long before we started noticing symptoms. 
maybe at really low levels and maybe you know the population has exploded because of different winter temperatures or or uh you know moisture like drought stress from 2020 you know it's it's really hard to know uh what uh you know what what stack of environmental and biological factors you know uh, cause a disease to or cause you know cause a tree to have no symptoms one year and then have look like it the next year look like it's been symptomatic it should have been symptomatic for five years and you know people like gary and greta they go out and they walk their woods several times a day i mean they're not going to miss some they're not going to miss a smoldering kind of a, you know infection and that goes the same same is true for all these other places that are infested the people in islesboro yeah. um it, all of a sudden you know one 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 day you know one year their, their trees are perfectly healthy and beautiful shade trees and the next year they're completely hammered from top to bottom with beech leaf disease and so, how are they, how did it jump you know why are you not seeing anything in vermont and new hampshire i mean that seems surprising just basically yeah it's surprising you know i par, part of it might be that well I think it probably has to do with funding, to be quite honest. I mean, yeah. all, all of our states, we, we just have this ragtag groups of people that are spread really thin and have tons of competing uh, uh, projects. And you just can't get out and you can't get to look. If you don't have an engaged public, um, it's really hard to, to do our jobs even closely as, as well as we'd like to. And that's why I think Maine is great. I mean, it seems like, especially groups like, like this and, and the land trust folks, you know, it's, it's these great populations of interested people that don't hesitate to snap a picture and reach out. And that's, that's really um, super appreciated by the people that I work with for sure. Um, Laura has a great question. So you had mentioned that, you know, what, what happens once you, once you identify a pathogen like this, um, she wants to know, are the local landscape growers, big box stores, uh, educated about what to look for and are they checking their stock before they are selling their trees? Yeah, but again, you know, that takes training and it takes, uh, it takes, you know, pretty keen eye. I think it's especially hard with nursery stock because, you know, you're not picking up nursery stock and looking at it, you know, looking through the, the canopy from below to see that banding. But, you know, Department of Ag has people that are out uh, beating the pavement, going to the different um, places where trees are sold and inspecting them for a whole host of diseases, not just, you know, they're looking at phytophthora root rot, they're looking for you know, insect pests, and there's a whole, you know, laundry list of things that they, they inspect for. But again, you know, there's not that many inspectors and there's a whole lot of places that sell trees. Um, you know, they're starting to look a little bit more at wholesale nurseries because that's where you know, so much of this stuff could originate. If a wholesale, wholesale nursery has, you know, be, you know, their stock has beech leaf disease, at least in low levels, and they're sending, sending it all over the country. And that's one way that it could certainly get, get around and, um, you know, maybe make these, these hops from, you know, from from uh, from Massachusetts into Maine, but I, I really feel like if people really got out and looked, you know, we'd find it. You know, in, in between, there's some people that talk about the migratory bird theory too. That like, you know, maybe it's some kind of a migratory bird that eats eats beech buds, ingests nematodes or nematode eggs, and then flies across, uh, you know, the ocean um, on its way to nest in northern Maine, and it's like a beach specific. Uh, uh, bird, um, you know, they're, they're actually looking at birds in, uh, in various different ways uh, right now in some of the research projects. So maybe that'll, maybe that piece of the puzzle will come together. Maybe, maybe we'll find out that after all, it's us again, you know, the people that are, you know, transporting all these, uh, you know, exotic diseases all over the planet, and kind of causing major problems for our forests. Well, we have a couple more questions that came in about beech leaf disease, but why don't you go ahead with the rest of yeah. your slideshow and, and we'll come back to those. Okay. So back to other depressing aspects of my job. Um, chestnut blight, um, like I said, that was a, a major disease of the past that you know wiped out a huge component of our forest um, through the Appalachians and into the Northeast. Dutch elm disease, all but eliminated elms, um, butternut canker, Maybe, maybe some of you are familiar with butternuts, maybe not. Um, every butternut that I've seen, except for one that I saw in Newport this year, um, have 
they've got butternut canker and uh, um, there's no confirmed resistance and it's pretty much wiping out that that tree that, you know, it, it's a pretty particular tree. It, it likes certain conditions. It doesn't grow in a lot of places, but it's, you know, an, a, a very good nut producing important tree for wildlife. Um, and then there's this, this uh, pathogen called oak wilt that's, uh, that's out there. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So oak wilt, definitely a cause for concern. It causes wilting of leaves. Uh, flagging of branches, which means, you know, branches are, die, they die with the leaves on. Um, oak wilt uh, has not been detected in Maine, thank goodness, and I hope that during my career it's not detected in Maine. Um, oak wilt disease and its causal fungus were first described in Wisconsin in the early 40s. It's caused by the fungus Brettsiella fagaceiarum. It used to have a different name. All the names are changing of the fungal diseases um, so due to different taxonomy, uh, studies. So it's hard even for me to keep up with them these days. But anyway, it's a vascular or systemic wilt fungus that's lethal to red oaks. It affects uh, trees similar to the way Dutch elm disease uh, affects elms, except uh, oak wilt is, is much more aggressive and can uh, very easily, once it's, you know, gets into a tree, it can kill a tree within a month. Um, that's kind of the, the, the record time for uh, killing a tree. Let's see here. Okay, so oak wilt is also similar to Dutch elm disease that it's, in that it's vectored by specific kinds of beetles, sap feeding beetles that are attracted to oak uh, wounds on oak trees. Um, and I'll talk. I'm gonna skip the slide. We'll go to the the uh, life cycle slide. There's a lot of speculation about where oak wilt comes from. It's not. Uh, it, you know, all all the genetic work that they've done with it indicate that it, it didn't come from like China or, you know, overseas someplace. It was something that uh, likely originated from Central America, or maybe there was some kind of a mutation um, where you know a, a non-virulent uh, fungus became super virulent, uh, or uh, once it was exposed to the Oretto coast, that it became, um, you know, an, an issue. So uh, white oak group oaks, uh, I don't know if you know the difference between those two, but there's two different types of oaks. So there's the red oaks that are you know, originally native to the North, North American continent. And there's white oaks that, that were, um, came here much later. Um, white oaks can get uh, oak wilt, but uh, they're, they, the, their decline in health is much slower. So they kind of act as a reservoir for disease. So this is the, the distribution map for oak wilt right now. And, you know, it kind of looks good. You think, oh, well, you know, it's, it's pretty far away, you know, and we don't have to worry about it so, so soon, but that's exactly what happened with beech leaf disease. And, um, you know, I look at this map and I think, you know, this map could look a lot different next year. I sure hope it doesn't. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's partially on, on us to, you know, leave our firewood at home and, um, you know, not transport plant material uh, around the way that uh, people do. So this is the basics of the oak wilt uh, life cycle. So these are nitidulid beetles or sap feeding beetles. They love things that smell yeasty and sweet. Um, you know, if you're out in your front porch having a beer in the summer, this is the one that flies into your, your drink. Um, and uh, so they're attracted to these fungal pegs that the, the fungus produces. The fungus will, will produce this you know, pretty impressive fungal structure that will actually um, create so much pressure that it'll pop open the bark. And then the, the beetles will, will smell this, this, uh, this fungus that gives us a smell that people describe as smelling like juicy fruit gum, if anybody knows what that smells like. But I, I kind of describe it as a kind of like a, a yeasty, sweet, fruity smell. Um, they go in there, they cover the spores, and then they will fly away and they'll visit another uh, a tree that's maybe been pruned recently or wounded in a, in a windstorm um, and the the spore gets uh, exposed to the the open wound and the fungus gets established and you get uh, wilting uh, discoloration of leaves wilting of branches as the vascular system is compromised by the fungus um, you get some staining in the xylem just like dutch elm disease infected uh, branches will have like a brown staining of the cambium and just like dutch elm disease this, uh, this disease trans, uh, is tr transmittable by root grafts. So when trees grow, grow in close proximity to each other, they have a tendency to jo you know, join the root systems. So there can be, you know, in a stand of trees, they could all have um, 
you know, some common root connections. And for vascular diseases, that's a great avenue to, once they get into a tree, then they can just travel through the root system and affect all the trees uh, that are connected. And that's how you get oak will pockets or pockets of mortality from oak will. And uh, that's, uh, this is a picture from the Midwest uh, um, where, you know, you can see there's a lot of dead trees, um, dead and dying trees. Um, and that's through root transmission of the oak will fungus. So, no, oh, no, my slides washed out. But the most important thing, the first take home message with uh, oak will is in yellow there and I'll read it for you if you can't read it. Oaks dropping their leaves in summer is reason to call us. Uh, that's, that's the easiest uh, symptom uh, of oak will. Um, if you have oaks and they just start dropping their leaves or they die unexpectedly um, in a kind of a, an acute way, uh, please give us a call at the, at the main forest service, uh, alert us to that. We will come and check it out. Um, here's those leaf symptoms again. You can see they're quite variable. So I don't like to go by the leaf symptom. There's lots of things that cause leaves to be brown to different types of fungi and other types of, you know, there's like bacterial leaf, leaf scorch and, you know, various other things. Um, there's also various things that uh, kill kill oak trees. This is uh, two different pockets of oak mortality that I, I took these pictures when I was in Minnesota at a oak wilt uh, workshop a couple of years ago. Um, here's my second take home message with uh, my second and third uh, take home messages with, with oak wilt. Um, crown symptoms can appear June through September. So, uh, and, and therefore we only we should get in the habit, even though oak wilt is not in Maine yet, we should get in the habit of pruning oaks in the dormant season and avoid wounding oaks and seal wounds that occur during the growing season. So if you have to prune an oak during the growing season, this is pretty much the only situation where I, I'm not big on pruning sealers. The, the, the literature doesn't really support their effectiveness. But in the context of oak wilt, I, I say if you if you have to prune your oak in the summer, seal the wound with latex paint or a, a, a manufactured you know pruning sealer that has all sorts of different uh, beneficial um, substances in it. So we've done survey for the past three years uh, in Maine. Um, this map is a survey that was done in 2020. Uh, where we visited 70 plus sites and the way we select these sites is we select areas with high amounts of oak and then high amounts of human activity because human activity is the way that the, the disease gets around people bring in firewood that have you know spore producing structures or beetles that have spores on them and uh, so we we checked out these 70 sites and we did not find any oak wilt in 2020 we didn't find any oak wilt in 2021 um, but we did find various other things like here you can see this picture on the left uh kermie scale where you have a bunch of scale insects that are all kind of feeding around uh the same area of a twig and cause the kind of flagging or dead uh branch symptom oak twig pruner which is a, a, a an insect that prunes through the middle of a branch and causes the branch to break um in the wind and then uh bot canker which has been caused it's caused by the um, used to be called Botria diplodia, but now it's uh, the name has changed to diplodia uh, corticula. So I think it should be called dip canker, but nobody else agrees with me. Um, but bot canker is is uh, another you know look alike symptom for for oak. Um, so again, causes for concern. If you see wilting, flagging, dying oak branches. Uh, pockets of, of oak that seem to be dead for no apparent reason and leaves uh, dropping in summer, please call us. Okay, so what about our native diseases? We talked about two, uh, oak wilt native, but uh, beech leaf disease is not native, but uh, what about our native diseases that are sort of going rogue um, for whatever reason, probably environmental reasons, but um, again, that's pretty speculative, uh, but white pine needle damage, Calisiopsis canker, root diseases, and red pine tip and shoot blights. And I've got to hustle because I got a 12 minutes, got to get through all this, so hold on tight. So on the left is a white pine tree, and it's almost, it's almost unrecognizable. Um, this is what white pine trees used to look like. Uh, Nowadays, they look more like the, the trees in the middle with uh, very thin, uh, lo low live crown ratios. So the amount of live crown to the, in respect to the rest of the tree, that's how one, an indicator of tree health. Um, and the reason for this 
<clears throat> has been, you know, 15 years of, with the exception of the last two springs, 15 years of wet springs, really wet springs. And remember, I talked about the importance of, of water to, to fungi and disease, disease process as well. Um, this is uh, this early defoliation and lower branch dieback is caused by something that we're calling white pine needle damage. And that's a, a, an expression that describes um, early defoliation, uh, yellowing of needles in, in, uh, in summer. And it's caused by three different uh, uh, causal agents, causal fungi. So we got Bifusella linearis, brown spot needle blight, and Duke's needle cast. And uh, these these uh, pathogens, you know, these pathogens have different sporulation times. And uh, brown spot needle blight is definitely the most common one, but uh, the other ones are definitely are are there and cause cause problems. And I think I'm getting yesterday's presentation mixed up with this one, but I'll just ex explain the disease cycle a little bit. So you've got these older needles, the, the fully elongated needles. And if you guys can see that there's some black bands on these, and that's, those are the fr fruiting structures of these, these diseases. And in spring, as the, the candles or the, the new needles are expanding, these are producing spores and infecting those new needles. And those new needles are going to stay asymptomatic for a full calendar year until next year, they'll look like these needles with the black bands and the process will continue. And that process means that, you know, you, you lose all of the older age class needles, they all get shed. So these trees are limping along, trying to gather enough energy for growth and defense based on just uh, current year needles. So we did, a, we did an assessment uh, back in 2018, and the results are just getting published here in 2022, but uh, it was a regional, regional pro project that we did with the New England states in New York. And these are the sites from Maine that we, that we uh, evaluated. There's 50 sites and uh, just about, I think almost all of them with the exception of maybe two, we found at least one uh, type of needle disease. So the important thing to remember about this, these needle diseases is that the moisture conditions of the previous spring dictate the level of disease the following summer. So if you had a dry spring 2021, like we had super dry in May and, and June, which, are, which is the sporulation period of, of these diseases, that should mean that we shouldn't have, we should have very low levels of white pine needle disease or white pine needle damage um, in 2022. But if you remember back to 2020, that was a pretty dry spring too. And 2021 had as bad needle damage as I've seen since I've been here. And this is something that we've been tracking and recording since uh, I think it was 2011 is when we first showed up in our reports. And uh, I think, I believe it was happening uh, before that. And it's just been, you know, these prolonged periods of wet weather in the spring um, and you know, fogs in the coastal area, th these are really the drivers of this disease. And that's why our trees look like this in, in June. Um, you know, all the needles are, are impacted except for those, those newly expanding, uh, you know, new candles that are, are getting infected, but they're not gonna be symptomatic. So instead of having trees that look like this, which is a very rare uh, scene from Penobscot Research Forest, I took this picture after doing the beech leaf disease plots, um, I was driving down the road and I said, what are those trees? Well, they're white pine that aren't decimated by white pine needle damage. And the reason for that is probably because this is a real low density stand. So these needles are, if there's a rain event, they're going to dry out pretty quickly. So and that, that's enough to keep them healthy. So instead of our trees looking like that, they look like this. This is from down Sanford area. And yeah, it's, it's next to an area that got cut over, but I mean, all the pine trees looked extremely bad in this area. And that's, that's typically where we see the worst white pine needle damage on those drought prone soils further down to the south. But you look at the map, I mean, it's pretty much all throughout our, uh, our white pine resource. So white pine needle damage, white pine decline. So we have thin crowns due to reduced needle retention. Um, and when trees don't have a full complement of needles, they can't photosynthesize to support tree growth and defense functions. Chronic uh, infection raises impact on, uh, raises questions about the overall impact of trees. Here's some more yucky looking pines that are yellow. Um, so trees that are stressed like this, they don't grow um, and they are very attractive to uh, secondary agents. Um, you know, the, the second level of, in that spiral of decline. Um, 
things like calisiopsis canker, which is a stress-related canker that's uh, indicated by internodal pitching. So when you see pitching coming out of the branch worlds, you know, every year that a pine tree grows, it, all, the, all the branches come out from the same area. So if you see pitching from that area where the branches come out, that could be an indication of internal rot. But when you have pitching in between your nodes um, and, and copious pitching like, like this, uh, that can be certainly be an indication of calisiopsis canker. And if you look through, if you've got great eyes and you're very observant, you might be able to find these tiny little eyelash-like uh, fruiting structures. They're actually quite quite pretty, but you know they're they're or elegant, I guess I would say. But um, uh, that that is a sign that confirms the symptom of calisiopsis canker. And there's very little known about this disease. Uh, we are in cooperation with Michigan State University. We did a uh, we did last year. We started doing spore trapping for them um, up in the uh, research forest at Orono, um, or it's actually an old town, but um, epidemiological studies. So trapping spores to see okay when are these spores produced and for how long and in what amounts and at specific times um, and what environmental conditions uh, are conducive to this tr uh, this tree disease really getting going. Um, and I mentioned root diseases before. This is the sort of ubiquitous uh, final nail in the coffin disease. It's armillary root disease that can attack lots of different uh, uh, species of trees. Um, you can see this kind of whitish material here indicated by the yellow area. That's the pathogenic form of the disease. That's the disease actually killing this. This, this is a hemlock tree and it's in soil that's been inundated from flooding. Um, the sort of the resting uh, saprophytic stage are these black, um, they're called rhizomorphs, which means uh, root form in, in Latin. And, and that is uh, an indication of armillary root, root disease and what gave it its common name, which is shoestring rot. But this is uh, a, this and other root rots are, are likely agents that'll, that'll uh, knock out pines uh, that are stressed. I don't know that we're going to have time to talk about uh, diplodia tip blights, Syracaucus shoot blight, but these are two pathogens that are in fact in impacting <clears throat> not only our uh, red pine plantations, which were planted extensively in the 70s after spruce budworm, but um, impacting red pine, native red pines as well. And again, it's probably due to weather uh, and also red pine maybe not being really suitable for most of the places it's planted in uh, in Maine, but it leads to the death of, of tips, um, which are very energy dense tissues. So when a true tree leaves, loses those, and that's, that's got all the energy for the, the year's needles and everything in it. And when the tree loses those and has to remake them and then loses them again and re, you know shoots out another dormant bud, which gets killed, you get this, uh, this symptom that's called lion's tailing and uh, it, the, the trees have a really hard time with that. So here's Diplodia tip light. Uh, you got a dead tip uh, on the right. The, the disease hit right after needles started to elongate. And then on the left, you've got a healthy one. Um, the cone scales, if they have little black dots on them, that can be an indication. Those are the fruiting structures or spore producing structures of Diplodia tip blight. Syracaucus shoot blight usually hits uh, shoots when they've expanded a little bit longer. That's less common in, in Maine, but it's certainly common. Um, uh, just, it's just that we find Diplodia tip light in almost every plantation that we visit. Syracaucus, I think we find, I, we did an informal survey of this a couple of years ago, and uh, we think we were finding Syracaucus about 40% of sites and 80% of sites for, uh, for um, Diplodia tip light. So instead of having red pine stand that looks like this, and this is one of those rare sort of healthy red pine stands from way up in Arusta County, um, I can I can see tip light in there, but it's just not really that bad. Instead of having them look like this, we have trees that look like this. And this is from New Canada. Um, um, yeah, so you get lower branch dieback, and you know if the trees aren't a good uh, good enough site, they can kind of outgrow the uh, the dieback. But um, if they're not on a good site, they tend to have problems. Anthracnose diseases are very weather dependent. They 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 ebb and flow. Sometimes they can be very serious, and you can have uh, localized uh, area, uh, localized um, locations where you have, you know, very high levels of defoliation early in the spring, and then the trees refoliate. It's very stressful for them. But we don't, we haven't seen really widespread anthracnose outbreaks. So usually, you know, in one section of, of a county, 
but uh, uh, rust fungi, I really wanted to talk about these. I've got about a minute left. Um, white pine blister rust is uh, a rust, fun uh, rust fungi and rust fungi are pretty interesting. They have a lot of different uh, spore stages. And the reason that this, uh, this native uh, fungus or naturalized fungus, I guess I'll call it, um, the reason that it's changing our forest or it has the potential to change our forest is that we used to eliminate, we used to have a very extensive program in the early, uh, like in the 1940s to eliminate its, its uh, alternate host. So um, white pine blister rust is, is a rust fungus and it needs another plant species to uh, complete its life cycle. It's very complicated. I'm not going to go into it. There's five different uh, spore stages, two different species that the, the, the disease needs to cause symptoms. And this is the alternate host. And it just so happens that these are currants and a lot of people grow currants and gooseberries, which are the genus Ribes, alternate host for white pine blister rust. People grow them for, for food and traditionally did grow them for food, you know, in farmsteads. And so it was quite a, quite a bit of work that we had people, you know, running through the forest um, with herbicide and, you know, gloves pulling these up, spraying them with herbicide and pretty much eliminated, uh, not eliminated, but did a very, put a big, very big dent in the population. So we, we stopped seeing this, you know, you go to upper peninsula of Michigan, all the white pine trees look like they're terrible. They, they a lot of them, a lot of the regen dies, uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the tops uh, get impa impacted, infected and, and break off because they haven't eliminated those. The problem is, is that people are getting more and more interested in, in planting currants. And uh, we're finding a lot more instances where people are saying, you know what, I know it's against the law to, to plant currants in Maine, but you know, I really want to make some currant wine and have gooseberry jelly. So people are, are doing this. And, and unfortunately, it's my job to be kind of the policeman for this. And I have to go around and, you know, if I see currants that I have to get all tough and, and tell people that they have to pull them out and confiscate them and all this. And I really don't want to do that. Um, it's no fun at all. Uh, you know, and it, in any way, just word to word to you all, <laughs> please don't grow currants and uh, report anybody who, who is growing currants because, you know, if you had a big, beautiful uh, white pine uh, forest, you, you certainly wouldn't want uh, the impacts of white pine disease, which, you know, can be a very devastating disease. And, you know, white pines are the most economically important tree in Maine, and it also, it's also our state tree. And so we need to do what we can to protect it. And there is a quarantine uh, for, for uh, white pine blister rust, and that's, you can see that in the map here. Um, and outside of this quarantine, uh, you can grow some types of currants, but uh, European black currant is, is outlawed throughout the entire state. That's because it's, it's such an amazingly good secondary host for alternate host for white pine blister rust. And I'll just quickly mention drought's been terrible this last year and it's been bad the year before. And we, we may not see, we may not see the impacts of drought today, but we will in the future. Um, just because, you know, it was, it was super dry in May and June last year. Um, and just because it rained like crazy in July doesn't mean that the, the impacts are, are wiped away or washed away. Um, you know, when you have that, that stress, that acute stress, acute drought stress is something that can have knock on effects and that we'll see in various species uh, um, of trees in the, in the future. So uh, something to think about. Well, we had a big hail event down in Sanford. Um, we just don't get hail. When I lived out in the Midwest, yeah, hail was something that happened, you know, here and there from time to time. But um, we just aren't used to getting, you know, major hailstorms in, uh, in Maine. So extreme weather is definitely something that's different. I'm going to skip that one. Um, closing thoughts. Introduced, introduced diseases are changing our forests, but uh, wet weather drives many forest diseases. And some of our, uh, our natives are kind of going rogue and, and, you know, becoming major problems. Um, extreme weather patterns have been hard on trees for the past decade plus, and they continue to, to cause, you know, chronic and acute stressors uh, for trees. Um, and when trees are stressed um, and comp compounded by con con uh, contributing and inciting factors, that leads to quicker uh, decline in mortality for trees and back to that spiral of decline. So, uh, you know, we can't control the weather, um, but uh, we can control 
uh, what happens in our front yards. And, and so, you know, when you can mitigate stress, that's the best thing you can do to uh, encourage healthy trees. And with that, I believe, ah, I do have my email address there. So it's uh, aaron.bergdahl at maine.gov. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions now. Okay, and we do have some questions. And uh, for the sake of time, audience, I hope you don't mind. I might consolidate some of the questions and maybe not ask the full question. But we did have a few that came in where folks um, were very concerned about the bear populations and the beech nuts. So, can you talk mm -hmm. about uh, what can be expected there? Yeah, well, I'm you know I'm not a I'm not a wildlife biologist, but I do know that you know when there when um, when there's a heavy mast year for for beech trees, that meaning that they produce beech nuts, which are super energy rich food, very important for bears. Um, Eighty percent of sows will have cubs, and during non mast years, it's it's much lower. I think it's down 30, 40 percent, or something like that. So, you know, bear populations will be impacted by um, by by beech, you know, the issues that beech are having. So. Um, beech is a very ecologically important uh, species for nutrient cycling in the soils because the beech leaves are very high in nitrogen. Um, the, the, the nuts are very important. Uh, they're also great cavity nesting trees. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, ecological, um, related, uh, issues to, to these diseases that are impacting beech and, and bear, bear are definitely, um, one of those species that's going to be be impacted pretty severely. I feel like we can have a whole other presentation with the Inland Fish and Wildlife Department and they can, you know, listen on that because it, it's a huge, huge topic. I think it should. Um, okay, also I'm going to minimize this question a little bit. Uh, so if you find um, beach leaf disease, besides reporting to you, what should the average person do? Should they chop and burn? Is, is contaminating this, you know, is that a pipe dream? Um, I think at this point, you know, it's containing pretty, it, I'm sorry, it's containing it a pipe dream. Yeah, 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 no, I think we're pretty, we're past that now. Um, uh, we're not going to eradicate beech leaf disease from our forests. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not going to tell people to go out and clear cut their entire forest because of the, you know, they got beech leaf disease. Uh, we, we have a lot more to learn about it. Um, and so I would say, you know, like I said earlier, Look, look at you. Look at your your holdings, your your land, your your backyard, whatever it is, and manage it for diversity. Because you know, if it's not beech leaf disease today, it could be something tomorrow. It could be oak wilt. Um, and, and you know, having a diverse forest is is a healthy forest, and it's uh, one that's going to be the most resilient to uh, these different agents of, of decline and mortality, native and native and exotic. Um, are you looking at all overseas? Like, uh, so Amy wants to know if there's any hints of similar infection in Japan, and the t trees there have resistance, but it's still it's still present. Yeah, they, they do have problems with it. They they, uh, they do have beech leaf disease in Japan. Um, I'm not real. I don't have a lot of information on that, but I know that it's. I know that those Japanese uh, varieties of, of beech are impacted. Um, I'm, I'd be willing to bet that they're not as severely impacted, but I, I, I don't know that real well. Uh, I've been, I've been collecting pictures of beech leaf disease on all different types of, of cultivars that are available in nursery trade here in, the, in North America. And, and uh, yeah, that there's for every, yeah, I've just seen a lot of different varieties of beech that come from all over the world and now are all impacted by beech leaf disease. Um, okay, this is an oak question. David wants to know, he says, some of my red oaks retain leaves in winter. Most do not. Any explanation? Well, there's a, there's a habit in oak trees called marcescence, um, and, and some which, which describes holding on to leaves through, through the winter months. Beech trees are, have a marcescent habit, too, and they hold on to their leaves. So, um, you know, there's, all trees are different, just like people are different. You know, we're all people, but we all have you know, different, different things, different characteristics. So I imagine there's some, some genetic, uh, some genetic component to that. Um, I don't think it's a, a health issue necessarily. Um, if they, if they're, you know, exhibiting marcescence or not. Okay. And I'm going to wrap this up actually with a positive question. Um, so Anne wants to know what trees are doing well and what do you recommend to replace beach? Um, I don't recommend 
any one tree to replace beech, I recommend replacing beech with as many different genera as possible. When you get into the, the level of diversity for, uh, based on genus um, instead of species, you that's a much better kind of diversity than just, you know, having white pine, red pines, you know, stone pine and, you know, scotch or yugo uh, pine, you know, get, get as many different genera as possible. And, uh, and, and that's the best way to um, buffer yourself against, uh, against diseases. Uh, you know, and that, that may not really be possible with native trees, uh, you know, and, you know, if I were to recommend something and, you know, and, you know, sugar maple, and then, you know, you, you, we have, you know, uh, long Asian longhorn beetle will show up in Maine, and then, you know, then I'd, I'd look kind of silly, but, um, you know, I think diversity is the key, the key message and planting the right tree in the right place. Um, and, you know, try to keep, try to maintain your, your trees by mitigating stress, managing them. So they're not over planted, overstocked. Um, th those are the best, best things to do. Um, and there really is no replacement for beach. And that's just like there's no replacement for chestnut blight or ch American chestnut or, or uh, the American elm. So we just have to do the best with what we've got and with our sites and uh, try to make good decisions. And the forester certainly can help you do that. And actually, we had one more question come in, and then I promise I'm going to wrap it up. This is the last one. Um, so this person lives in Massachusetts, and there's a lot of managed logging happening in the state where they have the trees spaced out. Um, how is this going to affect the uh, the spread of disease and the sustainability of the remaining forest? Um, hmm. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so, you know, Rep reputable, you know, let's say, you know, a, a harvesting operation uh, will, uh, there's numerous people that are involved in, in timber harvest, the, the owner, the, the forester, the logger. And, uh, you know, if you've got good people on, on that team and people who are thinking about the right things in terms of forest health and in the future, um, they should be making, um, they should be making decisions that are you know, may look bad in the short term, but are positive for the forest in the long term. You know, we're talking about pine, you know, we, we kind of are rewriting the management recommendations on pine due to white pine needle damage. And, you know, we're talking about cutting more trees and, and ha having fewer trees per acre, trying to grow fewer trees per acre because it's, it seems to be better for, uh, you know, it seems to reduce disease pressure. So, you know, just because you see something and it maybe doesn't look too good, um, you know, there might be some, some you know, science-based reasons for that. And, uh, um, you know, you, you hope that the, the loggers and the, everybody involved are following the rules. And, and uh, there's a lot of good, really good, responsible people out there. And uh, you just hope that uh, people are following best management practices. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. This was a very informative and worrisome program, but I learned yeah. I'm confident. I, uh... I'm confident that everyone else out there did too. And I wanted to remind folks that again, I'm putting this recording on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. You're able to share it from there. And I mean, as Aaron described, the only way that we're going to be able to learn more about this and figure out the causes and figure out the spreads is if people know what to look for. And Aaron, this program did a great job helping us all understand a little bit more about what to look for. Um, I wanted to quickly, quickly mention that we have a program coming up next month uh, from the Coast Mounds Land Trust with our friend Roger Rittmaster, who recently got back from a trip to Peru, where he photographed over 800 different species. It's going to be very cool. So please participate with us. The program is going to be on February 10th at 6 p.m. And I will be getting the registration links for that up on the Camden Public Libraries page and over to the Coast Mountains Land Trust page very soon. Um, also, the Camden Public Library is going to have a Camden Garden Club Winter Horticulture Series. It's a morning program. It's gonna start on Tuesday mornings, January 25th through February 22nd at 9.30 in the morning. A lot of different topics. Visit librarycamden.org, the calendar of events. You could find out all about those talks and register for them. Aaron, once again, this was great. Thank you so much. Coast Mountains Land Trust, thank you so much. And all of you who showed up tonight, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future.
Right. Everyone. Thank you.